Welcome to iPad Pros, the show all about using your iPad to be productive and get work done. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. The display part comes in because above that keyboard where you have the six or eight keys that let you type in Braille is a line of cells. Braille cells are six dots a piece or eight dots a piece, depending on, there's, it's called computer Braille, and that's where you have eight dots. But in any case, you have these row of cells. They range from, say, 12 cells all the way up to 40 cells or more on a Braille display. When you're interacting with iOS with a Braille display connected via Bluetooth, what voiceover is saying is being written out on the Braille display in Braille. Today on the podcast is Shelley Brisbane, author of Access for All and an expert at accessibility on the iPad. In this episode, we dive really deep into how users that are blind, deaf, or with limited mobility get work done on an iPad. I learned quite a bit from Shelly during this interview and hope you do as well. A quick reminder that if you haven't reviewed the show on Apple Podcasts, that I'd really appreciate it if you could do that today. If you want to support the podcast financially, head on over to patreon.com slash iPadPros. Every dollar goes a long way. Without further ado, here's my interview. Welcome to the podcast, Shelley Brisbane. Thank you. It's great to be here. Can you first introduce yourself and the work you do? Sure. I'm Shelley Brisbane. I have been a technology writer, not to be confused with a tech writer, more of a journalist and a author of uh, books and for trade magazines for a really long time and also a podcaster. I spent a number of years at Mac User Magazine back in the day, which is where some of my Mac and iOS modifieds come from, but I've been in that environment for a really long time as well. For my work currently. I am a producer and web editor at a public radio show called Texas Standard. It's a daily public radio news show. I also do a podcast called Parallel, and I write books. And the current one is iOS Access for All, which is a book about accessibility on iOS. Awesome. And that recently got updated to iOS 12, which kind of put me on your radar a bit there. Yeah, just uh, released the update a week or so ago, and uh, I'm really excited about it. So something I want to dive into is part of, I guess, the passion for you writing this book is you yourself have low vision, and this is something you're fairly passionate about as a result of that, right? Right. I have worked in what I guess people in the accessibility world would call the mainstream tech world for a really long time, and had never done any work specifically about accessibility, but I'd always kind of hacked for my own needs, done whatever the platform required as far as being able to, to use it. I got interested in writing about accessibility once Apple had added accessibility features specifically to iOS. It had been around in macOS for a while, but I'd never really got dug into it probably because I didn't use most of those features. And I looked around in 2012, 2013, and I was like, wait, there's not a good comprehensive resource about accessibility. There are a lot of little pieces and there's a lot of discussion of voiceover, which is the iOS screen reader, but there isn't really a comprehensive guide to all the stuff that Apple does. And so that was the passion I had for the book. And I had written books before and I felt like something I could bring to this project was a professionalism and level of detail that some of the other online resources didn't necessarily have. And what kind of features do you depend on on a daily basis to kind of get around your iPad to to make it usable for you? The big one I use is uh, Invert Colors. There are two versions of that in iOS now, Invert Colors and Smart Invert Colors. And basically what that does is create a negative image on the screen so you have a dark background and light text. In the case of Smart Invert Colors, it does not invert the images. So if you think of regular Invert Colors as looking at a negative, Smart Invert Colors lets you actually see the images as they're meant to be seen when the app supports it. And I also use uh, Zoom somewhat. You could Zoom the entire iOS screen or you can Zoom parts of it. I use that less with the iPad than I do with my phone, but occasionally I will do it. And then the last one that I, I use a lot is one called Speak Screen. Instead of voiceover is a full-fledged screen reader, which will read everything on screen with gestures. And we can talk about that in a little bit. But what Speak Screen lets you do is with a really quick gesture, it reads the contents of your screen, or in the case of, say, a book, reads the contents of your book aloud. So essentially, you, you create your own text-synthesized audiobook. And I use that a lot for reading long articles. And it started out kind of as an accessibility thing for me, but now it's a convenience thing for me because I can like be reading in my ears while I'm doing other things. So I don't know, it's half accessibility and half just a uh, way to, you know, get multiple things done at once. Yeah. So going a little, a little bit further, there are users of the iPad and iPhone that have no vision at all. 
and VoiceOver is one of the technologies that helps those users interact with these devices. Can you kind of explain VoiceOver and blindness in general and how users actually can get on with using touchscreens in that way? So VoiceOver is a screen reader. Just to limit any confusion, if you've heard of VoiceOver, you may have heard of it on macOS. It exists there too. But obviously, because iOS is a touchscreen, it behaves differently. In VoiceOver, it's all about keyboard shortcuts replacing any mouse activity that you have. But on a touchscreen, basically anytime you interact with the screen with your finger, you're going to hear something. You're going to hear speech. You're going to hear a tone. And the way VoiceOver makes that possible is that instead of, say, a single tap to open an app, it would be a double tap. So if I move my finger across the screen with VoiceOver enabled, I'm told what is under my finger, and then if I want to do something with it, I double tap to open, for example, or there are various other gestures that allow me to simulate things like pulling down the, well, it's not simulated. In fact, it, it, it opens the control center, opens notifications, pulls up the dock, and there are alternate versions of existing gestures usually it's one more tap so if you if you double tap to do something without voiceover on you might triple tap to do it with voiceover on or um, there is a feature in voiceover called the rotor which I don't think gets enough respect or appreciation just in terms of innovation because the rotor is essentially a dial and once you invoke the dial you can choose settings and then you can move through those settings for example that's useful in editing text so you can edit by character by line by paragraph and then you can manipulate the text as you need or have it read to you and the rotor is kind of like a super contextual menu in one in some ways and that's available while voiceover is on and you have some ability to configure some settings within it VoiceOver has enough gestures that you actually, I have an appendix in my book that is nothing but VoiceOver gestures, and Apple in its documentation for iPhone and iPad has a listing of VoiceOver gestures as well. And so the first thing you do as a VoiceOver user is kind of get to know those gestures, and then, you know, you learn some specific techniques as far as typing on the virtual keyboard and the like. But basically, it's just an alternate means of gesturing plus a speech so that you always know where you are on screen. Now, What's the typical discovery process for a voiceover user, someone that doesn't know what an iPhone screen looks like? Is is it through voiceover or is someone there helping them the, the initial setup or... Well, it depends on who the user is because blind people, just like any other group of people, have a wide array of uh, skill levels and of desires to interact with technology. So for some people, you can hand them a a slab of glass and they can explore and they can kind of get it. For other people, they appreciate a visual metaphor. Maybe they had vision before and they don't now. So you might explain the grid of apps on the screen or you might say, Apps typically have a menu, a bar, a a below, and some menu items above, and you sort of give some clues to how the interface works. And I think to the extent the person is able and interested, you want them to make those discoveries on their own. Mm -hmm. For example, you can set up an iOS device without sighted assistance, and that's a, a great way to learn. Unfortunately, it also means you need a couple of voiceover gestures in your back pocket that some people don't have. But I think most people who do training and a lot of people who do training of of blind users are themselves blind will say, I'm going to give you the guidance you need and I'm going to hold your hand to the extent your sort of personality demands it. But I want you to go out there and do it on your own. There's not a lot you can't do. Used to, you could set up without sighted assistance, but there were a couple of roadblocks. Now you can pretty much do it without sighted assistance. And one of the things I do in the book is give people their range of options. I say you can do everything from take the phone or the iPad home, set it up, go to town, all the way up to let the person in the store set it up for you. And they're happy to do that. And I found that I'm actually kind of surprised at how often you find in an Apple store somebody who at least gets the rudiments of voiceover. They might not have a full grasp of it, but they kind of at least get the basics. But I think the the goal, the the ideal situation is for somebody to to set it up as much on their own as they possibly can. And how does voiceover react to external keyboards? If you command tabbing, would it describe what app you're now over as you do that? So VoiceOver has keyboard commands that allow you to do 
iOS function. So there are keyboard equivalents of the voiceover gestures, as well as you can use the keyboard the way you normally would to type or to command tab or do any of those functions. And that's another appendix in the book is the whole series of, of keyboard gestures, because it's really cool. If you're a keyboard person, like I'm a, even on Mac OS, I'm really a keyboard focused person. And I also like external keyboards a lot. And if I'm in voiceover and if I know those commands, which are pretty straightforward, there's a thing called quick nav that essentially allows you to use the arrow keys to navigate yourself around the screen and is often used primarily within text documents. And so again, that's a pretty cool innovation that Apple has provided so that you can use a virtual keyboard as effectively or more so than the touch screen if you want to. Yeah. So something as I was kind of researching for this episode, I discovered, and I, I'd heard rumblings about this before, but Bluetooth Braille displays are something that are supported by iOS. Can you kind of describe what these are and how it all works? Sure. So a Braille display does several things. First and foremost, it can be a keyboard. So you can enter Braille on an iOS device the way you would with a virtual keyboard or an external Bluetooth keyboard. So think of it as a typing device. But the display part comes in because above that keyboard where you have the six or eight keys that let you type in Braille is a line of cells. Braille cells are six dots a piece or eight dots a piece, depending on, there's, it's called computer Braille, and that's where you have eight dots. But in any case, you have these row of cells. They range from, say, 12 cells all the way up to 40 cells or more on a Braille display. When you're interacting with iOS with a Braille display connected via Bluetooth, what VoiceOver is saying is being written out on the Braille display in Braille. A lot of blind people who prefer to use Braille, they learn to use Braille as their formative language. This is also great for people. This is something a lot of people don't know, but the people who are deafblind can use a Braille display to interact with iOS. So if they can't even hear voiceover, but they know Braille, they're able to use a Braille display and interact just as if they were listening to voiceover or if they were using the iOS device without. Like an external keyboard, a Braille display allows you not only to type in Braille, but to use those voiceover commands with Braille gesture equivalents. And I'd imagine some people, like I like to listen to music when I work, that would be a nice alternative to voiceover to have Braille do that part of it so you have your ears open for other things. Yeah, and I've Braille users are really innovative, inventive people. I am not a daily Braille user. I have been to conferences where I've seen people with a Braille display hanging around their neck and they can interact with their device as they're walking around. It's, it's kind of trippy to see. but uh, <laughs> So there's a variety of form factors then maybe, right? Yes. Yeah, the, a Braille display typically is a smallish device. There's several kind of sizes and, and varieties of Braille displays, and without getting too far into it, there's something called a note taker, which is a whole other device. A note taker essentially has a computer inside of it and can be used more like a tablet, like an Android tablet, or, or an, I say Android tablet because they are based on Android by and large, but they also have display functions. A display-only Braille display, typically its job is to interface with a device like a Mac or a PC or an iOS device. And the form factor factors of those things, I would say often they're six inches to eight inches wide, maybe, and then maybe four inches deep or something, and then a couple of inches high. And again, it really depends on the number of cells. They're very portable. And because they're Bluetooth devices, you know, they're intended to be be portable. They're almost always one single line of cells, which is sort of a limitation of Braille. You can't like read vertical sets of lines of text, although there, there's there's a couple displays out there that are tr- trying to change that. But for mo- most of the Braille displays that you'll see are like one line of continuous Braille cells from like 12 cells to 40 cells. Is there a recommended model that's like the go-to in the market right now? It really depends because the first, I think the first thing people do is look at the number of cells because they're seriously expensive. There's a couple of models now. The, the, the prices of Braille displays have just started to come down in the past couple of years. But a typical Braille display, sort of the high and middle end, might be $3,000. Oh, wow. And okay. It, yeah, they're very expensive. They're way more expensive than your iPad. <laughs> and and it, it's, it's very much dependent on the number of cells. So somebody might say, I, I really want a Braille display, but I can only afford, say, 12 or 16 cells. So that might be a couple thousand dollars. But somebody who's doing you know, production or maybe a lot of presentations or something like that, they may say, I want a 40 cell display and I might pay $4,000 for it. And it is the Braille cells themselves. They're these piezoelectric cells that rise and fall when you uh, issue Braille commands that run the cost up. And so what's happened recently is that technology has made it possible for cheaper Braille displays 
displays to be produced, but there always are, are compromises, as you can imagine. So it was a, a huge deal in the blindness community when a $500 Braille display became available. And there are compromises, but there are a lot of people who have never had a Braille display before who now have them, and they pair great with iPads and iPhones. And these are micro USB rechargeable key yes. displays? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And you asked me about model. And I'll say that there are several companies that make them. Apple supports about 70 of them. You link to a page and there's a great page that, that shows all the devices that Apple supports. Basically, if it supports Bluetooth, these days, almost any display will work with iOS. Used to be it was a little more fidgety and Apple had to affirmatively support it. Some of the leading vendors are Humanware and Hymns and Freedom Scientific and some people have very strong brand preferences. Sadly, lamented brand called Baum that has just gone out of business, and they produced what a lot of people called the Apple of Braille displays because they were just very elegant, very they brushed aluminum cases, just really pretty devices. And so when you ask people their preferences, it's either a brand that they're really familiar with or it's something like Baum where it was just a super elegant piece of hardware. You can't say that there's one that is far and away above the others. The differentiation in features tends to be at the note taker level because as I say, those are essentially Android computers inside. They can also be used as braille displays. So there are people who will buy a note taker and use it with an iOS device or an Android device or, or the like. And people have strong preferences about that because different software is included and, and the like. And is the refresh rate pretty steady between all the models? There are some that are faster. The, the, the ones that are sort of in the high price band are faster refresh rate than these the $500 ones. That's one of the big differentiating factors between the bargain basement is the wrong term, but just mm -hmm. in terms of comparing them to like a $3,000 device, yeah, your refresh rate is going to be somewhat slower. And again, I think if you want to get into Braille, period, and you don't have a lot of needs for super high, you know, if you're not reading a ton or like one of my favorite uses for Braille displays is like for, for, for presentation. So I can stand up there and work on my iPad and, and have the Braille display in my hand and I don't have to look down and, and the like. So for that, I would want a pretty high refresh rate. But yeah, that is one of the things that differentiates the really inexpensive ones from the, the higher priced ones. And then also the quality of the dots and just how likely they are to fail and, and the like. But the $500 devices, the, the Orbit readers have only been out for a year or so, actually less than that in, in this country because the availability was kind of low. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, it remains to be seen whether people will abandon those super high-end products for the, the cheaper ones or not. I think one of the other problems, a lot of professionals, you know, wouldn't accept anything less than a 40 cell display. Yeah. And what's a typical range of refresh rate? How long are we talking for that display to update with what voiceover is telling you? I honestly don't know. It's reasonable. You're not waiting a super long time. It's actually, it's surprisingly quick. Yeah. Because if you think about it, it, it kind of depends, too, on how fast you have your voiceover speech running mm. because your refresh rate might not be able to keep up with you or the reverse might be true. And a lot of voiceover users play their speech really, really fast. It's not unusual to have somebody at 70, 75% of the maximum. Yeah. And has miniaturization made it to the point where an iPhone case could have the back of the case be a Braille display? Is that something that's being thought of at this point? Not quite yet. I don't I don't think so because you have to have room for both the cells and the the dots and I I I think for a lot of people that wouldn't be desirable. However, iOS does have a feature called Braille screen input that allows you to type Braille on the screen. And the value of that is for somebody who prefers to type in Braille, especially if your choice is Braille or the virtual keyboard, what you basically do is with VoiceOver on, you turn the rotor to a function called Braille screen input, and then you have pads on the screen that represent dots. And when you use those pads, you, you are essentially typing in Braille, and then the iOS device translates it for you. We'll do that on their phone, but I really find the iPad is very conducive to, to Braille screen input because it's big. Yeah. Now, speaking of just iOS in general, is accessibility better with the full screen app approach of iOS versus the Mac and window management and that whole world? I think so. I think people are becoming more aware of that now. I don't know that when iOS first became accessible in the first few years that people thought about it that way. And especially there was sort of this, like intuitively, it made more sense that a Mac with window management and keyboard shortcuts would be 
a logical interface and a touchscreen would not. But I think now that's much less the case. And, and part of that is that Apple hasn't really kept up with voiceover on the Mac to the degree that they have with voiceover on iOS. I think there are a lot of people who find voiceover on, on iOS easier to work with. And again, you know, iOS itself has become more capable, so you're able to do more stuff. Yeah. It's not that iOS voiceover has really added that many features. I think it's just the nature of the touchscreen. The, the interesting thing about a touchscreen interface is it's easy to describe it to somebody spatially. So I can explain, this is your grid of apps, this is where something is, but its location on screen is more meaningful in a touchscreen environment than it ever would be with Windows and keyboards on macOS. You're never going to use the mouse in any context in macOS. VoiceOver on iOS, where something is on screen can be part of your understanding of your environment in a way that's useful to a blind person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does, and then I guess feeling the device in your hand, you can tell orientation and does lack of home buttons and things of that nature make that more of a challenge, removing those things? In terms of orientation, I don't think it matters because obviously the if you if you have orientation unlocked, you could have it flipped in either direction. You could have it horizontal. You have landscape or portrait. I think the lack of home button is more of an issue for people who have difficulty with face ID, which we can talk about. But it really doesn't matter. Like I yeah. pick it up and I know it's in landscape mode and it adapts to where I am unless I have the orientation locked, which almost nobody would do. Is there a voiceover or something to indicate that the camera is being covered? If you can't see the screen, how's that addressed? Do you know? That's a good question. It's not. When you get into camera and you were to take a picture, it would tell you that. Mm -hmm. So what I thought you were going to say is and is that uh, when there were home buttons, when you would turn on voiceover, it would say uh, voiceover on home button to the left, which was always kind of funny because when there was a home button, it would tell you. And now that there's not, it does, there's nothing for it to tell you. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know that I can... Uh, triple click the home button to pull up the shortcuts to different accessibility features. Yep. How is that addressed with current iPads? Do you know? You do that with the side button. Okay. And that's the same way on all the iPhone 10s as well. Okay. Another kind of realm of accessibility are those with motor disabilities not being it's a touch screen and if you have difficulties even, you know, interacting with touch in that way. What kind of things does Apple do to help those people? So increasing level of sort of complexity, there are basically three. Touch accommodation, assistive touch, and switch control. So touch accommodation is a series of alternate settings that allow you to change the length of time required for a touch to become effective. In other words, if I need to touch harder and longer in order to interact with the screen, then those settings will allow me to to change what the impact of those touches are. The same thing with the keyboard. So there's like there's what's called sticky keys. The middle level is assistive touch, which is a feature that presents a menu. It's actually a square of little boxes on screen that allow you to interact with the device with those buttons rather than the typical manner. So in other words, if it's easiest for you to interact with, to get Siri's attention or to use the app switcher without having to do the, the swipe, if you have trouble swiping, this is what assistive touch is really good for, then you would uh, press a button with your finger that would open up the app switcher or that would activate Siri. And there are a lot of buttons that are built in, but there also there is the ability to create your own custom gestures or create button presses that do particular things. And then there's switch control. Switch control allows a person who uses switches, uh, they're probably somebody who can press a button with a finger, but they probably can't manipulate, they can't swipe, they can't double tap, they can't do all the touchscreen gestures. So with a series of switches, that scan the screen, uh, that person can create gestures that map to those switches. So I might have four switches, and one switch is a tap, another switch is a double tap, another switch is a flick, and I create a menu of switch actions that allow me to interact with the screen. And all the time when switch control is on, scanning is occurring. So that first the top row of apps is selected, then if I tap, then it selects the first app on the row and the second app on the row, and then I tap again if I want to open up the third app in the row. So there's a combination of uh, scanning and then mapping particular commands to a switch. And it's kind of a complex process. A lot of times the way that happens is 
that somebody in a vocational rehabilitation setting with the cooperation of the company that makes the switches will essentially create a rig for somebody. And I've seen these iPad rigs that are kind of amazing, and they mount them on wheelchairs or on some other apparatus, and they have all of the switches configured. They're Bluetooth switches or USB switches or a combination of the two. And the user is taught that this one switch is the tap switch, and this switch is the right swipe switch, and this switch is the left swipe swipe switch. And they just learn to use that in the same way that you would learn to use alternate voiceover gestures. You just use your switches to manipulate your device. And I think this is a situation where you're probably going to have to have somebody provide assistance in at least initially configuring the switches. Mm -hmm. And then some people are going to have the ability to do configuration on their own, and some people are not. Right. It sounds like it builds a little bit off of, before you mentioned the keyboard you can use to uh, toggle through your, say, home screen to find the app and open it, where it's selecting different parts of the screen in that way. Yeah, and actually, because not every app supports voiceover, and one sort of shorthand for whether an app is going to work with switch control is whether it works with voiceover, because the ability to select and then manipulate something that's on screen is going to translate between those two functions if that's helpful to understand kind of how it works. Yeah, like I'd imagine, obviously, a drawing app would be pretty difficult unless developers would use like a face ID camera that use like eye tracking to like move a pen in that way or something. Yeah, and there's not really any eye tracking on iOS that I'm aware of. Eye gaze is what it's called, is a feature that's pretty big deal in computing. People do it on, with helmet-based apparatuses and other and other things like that. And that's available in a lot on a lot of computing platforms, but it hasn't really made its way into the mobile world. In the mobile world, it's more about just moving from one interactive element of the screen to another. And then you can do things like control the scan rate so you can move faster or slower, just so you can increase the speech or speed of voiceover speech and that sort of thing. So there's a lot of configuration. You can create custom sets of settings that with a switch can be active. There's a lot of stuff you can do with it. Yeah, the only thing I've seen that does Face ID interaction, there's a web browser that lets you, I guess, scroll through the page with the camera. Mm -hmm. That's Yeah, but I don't think it's that far along at this point. Well, I think that's the thing, because if it's going to use the true depth camera and be Face ID based, that obviously has only been around for a year or so, and we just now got it on iPads. Yeah. Because iPads are really the device where switch control is a thing. Voiceover users are going to use iPhones and iPads. There's a way in which it kind of doesn't matter which they use, although I will say quickly that I have friends who are voiceover users who love their iPads and who use it you know, most of the time. But I think if you're a Switch user, even though it's perfectly functional with iOS, then an iPad is a much richer environment for you. Sticky keys you mentioned earlier. What is the experience of using that like? It's basically a toggle. It's not, well, actually, no, it's not. It's, it's an interval. I think it's in seconds or parts of a second. And you just kind of have to experiment with, but I'm thinking mostly on the virtual keyboard. It'll work with external keyboards too, but it's really intended for a virtual keyboard user who, let's say, you can accidentally press keys that you don't want to press. So you can say, I want it to require a firmer touch, which translates into a longer touch, basically. So you hold down the key a little bit longer, and it waits for you instead of just instantly typing the key that you pressed. But it's in fractions of a second interval, so it's really a matter of experimentation. Like, you can turn it off and on, but then once you turn it on, you set the interval. Okay. So it's reducing accidental input, which that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. And then there are third-party software keyboards out there. You mentioned Braille keyboards, and that's kind of built into the OS. Are there third-party software keyboards that help with accessibility needs? There are some. Keyboards was a thing, I guess, in iOS 9. A lot of people were putting out software keyboards, and some people did market keyboards for accessibility, and that kind of went by the wayside a little bit. But there are some. There's one out called Swipe. Swift Key used to do it. I think they're gone now. But there aren't a lot of them anymore. That and there, Even some of the ones that did accessibility back in the day, like part of what they would do was they would change the interface of the keyboard so they'd be good for a low vision person. Reverse the colors. I'm sorry. That's what I was trying to say. Because a lot of the keyboards in iOS are still like, they don't even play very well with invert colors. But as far as accessibility, as like what the keyboards did, there were a lot of I think they just rearranged the keyboard so that it might be easier for somebody who was typing one-handed, say. Mm -hmm. I don't think they're really updated all that much anymore. Swipe is the only one I can think of that sort of 
specifically markets itself as an accessibility keyboard. Yeah, and I imagine dictation for some users would be a huge thing, so they'd use either the built-in one or, I guess, Dragon would be the other alternative. I think most people use built-in. Uh, Dragon is out there. I've heard that that is problematic for some folks, but built-in dictation in iOS is pretty darn good, and especially in the past couple of versions of the OS where it's allowed you to dictate for longer, it's a time limit rather than, you know, just a few words. So you can actually do several sentences and it tends to be relatively accurate, especially if you use, you know, good technique and get your mouth close to the microphone and that sort of thing. Yeah. And yeah, a lot of people do use it. So there are third party keyboards, but there's also just full out apps. Is there an ecosystem of apps with accessibility in mind? Is it just supporting voiceover or is there something more to it than that? Well, there are a lot of apps that just have functions that a person who has accessibility needs uh, would use. So they're, they're mm-hmm. not necessarily providing additional accessibility. They're just doing stuff a blind person might want to do, for example. So there's a great app called Voice Dream Reader, and it will take text from all sorts of other formats, uh, PDF, EPUB, anything that w- can, can generate text, and it can suck it into Voice Dream Reader. It has its own, it's called self-voicing. It has its own set of voices. You can control all the characteristics of voices, including speed. You also have a visual interface, and the point is it can. it's a reading app. And so you can essentially queue up articles or books even in, in playlists, and you can just, you know, create your own audio reading list, your own playlist. So that's one that I like. There are a lot of navigation apps, especially for visually impaired folks. There's an app called Blind Square, which is designed to orient you to your surroundings. It uses the GPS as well as Foursquare data to tell you how far you are from points of interest. Because it's designed for a blind person, it always knows that you're in pedestrian mode. It always knows that you want to know in terms of feet how close you are. Several apps that do this. Blind Square is one, Seeing Eye GPS, some of the navigation apps have more sort of specific functions, like like Ariadne GPS is more of a what you might have thought of a, of a GPS in, at a sporting goods store in the old days, where it's it's really a compass and it's for walking around out in the great outdoors. It's about you know how am I doing walking around in the woods? Where you you set a starting point, you set an ending point. It helps you you know, find your way to that location. There are a lot of apps that use cameras for the camera for scanning. So for example, you can have it read uh, signs to you. You can have it uh, read, well, we can do QR codes in iOS now, but before then, uh, a lot of apps included QR code readers. So you can take text in your environment and scan it. There's an app from Microsoft called Seeing AI. Amazingly, from Microsoft, this is an amazing <laughs> app. So, yeah. so, so Seeing AI has a lot, has six, I think it's up to maybe eight functions. One of them is a, a short ca- text scanning function, like I just described. So if you find text in, envir- in your environment, it'll scan it. There's a color identifier in there. There is a, um, a it's a fun feature, it's a people uh, identifier. So you point it at a person and it tells you, 45-year-old man smiling. And it's really fun to point it at people and see how wrong it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you can embarrass yourself or them. You know? But what Seeing AI is trying to do is take those sort of basic identification and navigation features that iOS already has and add some AI functions to it, which is what that people identifier is about. And they keep adding stuff to it. It's really kind of an amazing app. It's only been out a year and a half. It's free. Yeah, imagine if you're on like a wheelchair and just on kind of ambiently kind of working? Is that kind of the use case for that app? Well, not necessarily in a wheelchair. I mean, seeing AI, uh, you, well, color identifiers is obviously useful for identifying you know, clothing, stuff like that. Mm-hmm. As far as identifying a person, uh, you, you might want to know something about the people in the room. Uh, I think, I think the, co- the person identifier thing is mostly an AI use case thing. It's yeah. just like to show that it can be done. Uh, the short text thing, you could use it for a menu on a wall at a fast food place or in an airport. You could use it for a lot of blind folks uh, use uh, scanning apps to read labels on the products in their homes or recipes or, you know, their mail. I mean, how does a blind person read their mail? Well, yeah. typically they scan it. Right. And then there are a ton of apps for people with disabilities in education. There are apps for kids on the autism spectrum. There are apps for people with multiple disabilities. So teachers, I I put some of them in the book, but all of the information I have about them comes from teachers who have just talked about, you know, what they do and how they do it. But there are a ton of very specific iPad apps, vocabulary building apps for people on the autism spectrum, for example. There are apps with low vision people in mind that have large text games and and the like. There's a ton of them. I think I have about 100 
of them in my book that are. The apps that I include in my book are, are accessible, and then the apps that are specifically oriented toward accessibility tools and functions, I think might be like 15 of them, something like that. But there are quite a few more. And Apple has featured them frequently in the App Store. So there is an accessibility section. I think it's almost always findable in the App Store. And the Shortcuts app, I know probably building those could be challenging for some users, but does that app present added benefits there? Shortcuts is fully accessible, and I know a lot of people who use it when it was Workflow and it was accessible, too, to VoiceOver. Okay. Shortcuts is, is easy to work with, and I think for somebody who has the interest and the desire to do it, it's it's a super easy way to build an accessible tool. Now, you could certainly come up with applications for an accessibility app that like somebody could could maybe make for for a switch control user who who might not be able to create the app themselves but i think generally speaking people are going to be able to make their own shortcuts i think shortcuts will be a great accessibility tool once it matures and once people figure out how they want to use it. Mm-hmm. I mean, I use them a lot. I know a lot of people who use them a lot for things like in their own lives, but not having to do specifically with accessibility. A friend of mine has an app that has a shortcut that is kind of fun. He can search for just the emoji he wants. And so he has he says, hey, Siri, find a dolphin emoji, and it'll find it for him. And he can copy it and he can paste it wherever he needs it. Because one of the great lacks of emoji is the ability to search. <laughs> <laughs> so, yes. All sorts of really important stuff like that, right? Yes, absolutely. And there are people who, you know, will pass text through shortcuts so that they can turn a text on a web page into some, you know, to have it read aloud to them if they want to. I really feel like it's going to take another version or two before people start going, hey, I can make something that's a combination of different actions that creates an accessible experience. Yeah. So I know Siri gets some hate compared to Alexa and the other ones. Is there, from an accessibility standpoint, are there major holes in Siri and what it's capable of today? I don't think that they have to do with accessibility. I think that they're just Siri. I mean, the advantage Siri has is that it's built into the device that you have in your hand because you can make Alexa and Google Home, you know, jump through hoops and they can automate your house and they can answer questions and stuff like that. But you're holding Siri in your hand. Right. If you're talking about accessibility, you're talking about, can I make my phone do something that enhances my accessibility? For starters, you can say, hey, Siri, turn on voiceover uh, or turn it off. Yeah. It can open apps. Yeah. It can just super basic stuff like that. Mm -hmm. All the accessibility settings, you can say raise brightness, lower brightness, things like that. So if there's a function that is easier for you to not have to have your hand on your device to do. Siri is obviously going to be able to do that better than the Echo can because, you know, the Echo is not (laughs) controlling my phone right, (laughs) or my iPad. So we mentioned a little bit ago uh, hearing impairments. What kind of tools are there in OS to help those users? So iOS supports hearing aids, a lot of them. And again, this is something, this is more so than Braille displays. You do want to make sure that a hearing aid is specifically compatible with iOS, but there is a long list of them. And Apple has worked with a lot of the major hearing aid manufacturers. So that's a super great way for somebody to have access at all times to the audio from their phone. A new thing in iOS 12 is what's called Live Listen for AirPod. Live Listen has been a part of the hearing impaired feature suite for a while, which meant that you could use your iPhone microphone as ambient hearing aid. You could listen to what was going on in your environment. And now that's available with AirPods. So if you have AirPods, you enable Live Listen and you put your phone on the table and perhaps you can hear the person you're dining with a little bit better, especially if you point the microphone uh, toward them, which is it's a pretty cool feature. So even if you're not using a hearing aid, you can use AirPods to sort of enhance your audible experience. Yeah, I don't have, I don't think any hearing issues, but I know at restaurants, even I can't hear across the table a lot of times. And then kind of along with that FaceTime and sign link, which is something I noticed was something that Apple is featuring kind of on their website. Is that something that's being used a lot? Is sign language kind of a good tool with FaceTime? Yeah, and I think that was one of the first things that Apple obviously promoted because it enables somebody to communicate with family and friends via sign language over FaceTime. And now, of course, we have multiple person FaceTime, so the whole family can communicate. And there's nothing specific about the way FaceTime behaves for a hearing impaired 
person, but it, mm-hmm. it does work. And so I think there are a lot of people who do that. Also, something interesting to note that it's not FaceTime specifically, but until the iPhone, but I guess smartphones in general, deaf people communicated with a service called TT, TDD. They used a machine called a TTY. And basically, it was a, a teletype machine that a deaf person had in their home or office, and they would type what they wanted to say to somebody on the phone. And through an interpreter, uh, that message would be relayed to somebody on the other end of the phone that they were talking to. Or if they were both deaf, they would have a TTY machine on the other end that had a terminal that let them communicate. Well, that technology is kind of superfluous when you have text messaging, right? Right, yeah. Then there's something called software TTY. It still exists in iOS, but I don't know if anybody uses it, which essentially allows you to Instead of using TTY devices, you can type back and forth, but you can certainly do that with text messaging as well. That's kind of interesting because when iOS first came out, one of the accessories they provided was this TTY adapter. So you could attach your iPhone to a TTY device. And I I guess the idea there was, I'm not sure if it was both a sender and receiver. So I don't know if it was getting the TTY messages or whether you were just typing on your keyboard. But uh, I just remember it was one of those Apple 2995 adapters like they like to sell. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Communicate through uh, the headphone jack? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think now TTY is, you know, has essentially become obsolete. Although, I mean, if somebody is communicating via their iPhone with an office, you know, maybe they're calling the cable company or something. Mm -hmm. Obviously, I guess you use live chat for that. I think TTY has one way or another, it's kind of been replaced, but it's still something that's possible in the iOS environment. Now, is there anything in iOS 13 that you'd hope would get stressed with accessibility concerns or are all the major concerns kind of addressed at this point? I think... People who have accessibility needs are like every other iOS user in that the the feature that they want is always like the most important one. And that we get down to sort of the nitty gritty of things and we say, you know, I would like to make my experience nicer or more pleasant. And we kind of take for granted the accessibility that we have. And I, I introduce it that way just to say that my features, the things I desire most are mostly small bore. The big bore one, though, is just more app support for accessibility because Many third-party apps do a great job of supporting voiceover and switch control and all the other features. Apple provides accessibility guidelines. They do encourage developers to support them, but you still have apps that are inaccessible or are partially inaccessible, which is super frustrating because you buy an app and then, wait, does it work or doesn't it? I think that the thing that everybody always says is just more accessible apps. As far as what Apple can do, I mean, I use a combination of low vision features, and I would sort of like the ability to create a macro set of features and just turn on Shelly's accessibility features and have those features available in iCloud so they could go across my devices so that I don't have to go into accessibility settings and tune each device each time, you know, for for my particular combination of accessibility settings. And I think voiceover users would find that helpful because everybody has a voice they like, everybody has a speed they like, everybody has a number of settings they want in the rotor or not in the rotor, and just some sort of macro ability, some ability to create a set of settings that is just your own would be a super cool accessibility feature. I think in general, they've covered most of the bases. I think, I mean, there are bugs, and Mm -hmm. a lot of the bugs are in Braille display support, and those bugs are sometimes, because there are new displays that come out, sometimes Apple will create a feature that doesn't quite support Braille displays in the way that one would want. It's usually a change in an interface in an app that sort of breaks something. There is a sense in the accessibility community that innovation has kind of slowed and that sometimes bugs aren't addressed as quickly as they might be. Apple still is a leader in accessibility relative, say, to Android, so on the mobile platform. But I think there is a sense that they are a little complacent. For example, Smart Invert Colors is a great feature. I'm so glad that they provided the ability to see images as positives rather than negatives. But a lot of apps, including Apple's own, don't support it consistently. Most of them do, but there are circumstances in which they weirdly don't. And I just sort of shake. And it took them a while. Like Safari didn't support it out of the gate for in iOS 11. Hmm. And I just was like, yeah. what? What are you even talking about right now? And so that's unfortunate. The other thing is, and this is a pretty serious one, is that there are a lot of people who are blind or visually impaired who have difficulty with Face ID. And when Face ID came out for the iPhone 10, initially, I think a lot of people, and Apple certainly promoted this, felt like, yes, I can make Face ID work, whether it's somebody with prosthetic eyes, whether it's somebody who isn't able to open their eyes, whether it's somebody who just does not 
give the attention that Face ID wants you to give. People had difficulty with it, but I think for the first year, there was a lot of sort of, well, it's not that bad. I can deal with it. And then as more people got 10-level devices, whether they were the, the phones this year or now the iPad Pros, I think people are discovering that they're having more problems with Face ID. There is this feature called Require Attention that you can turn on or off. And with VoiceOver on, Require Attention is turned off so that you're supposed to be able to look at your phone without essentially making eye contact with it, and Face ID will activate, but that doesn't always work, and Apple itself has sometimes been a little uh, less positive than they should be about how important that is, and so I, I feel like Face ID is, for a lot of blind people, a work in progress, and so really like it if they'd fix that. <laughs> yeah, and I'd be curious if they added some kind of haptic feedback to as an option to like, oh, it worked, you're in. Yeah, but I don't know how they, I mean, they'd have to, they still have to fingerprint you in some way. Some people say the solution is essentially what, kind of what Android does, where you have a fingerprint under the glass or something. So mm-hmm. you have a touch ID as an option. I haven't experienced this myself, but since it's an iPad podcast, I'll say that my theory has always been that for an iPad user, it might be easier because a lot of people use iPads in stationary locations. They have it in a case or a stand or something like that. And so you might be in a better position to regularly, to use Face ID in a way that is consistently working, whereas if you're holding a phone, you might not be. I have an iPhone XR. I don't have an iPad with Face ID yet. It doesn't mean that Apple doesn't have to deal with it, mm-hmm. but it means that there are probably strategies for iPad users that iPhone users might not be able to adopt as easily. Right. Yep. Well, anything else before we uh, wrap it up? Uh, no, I think it was a, a very uh, thorough list of questions. I appreciate it. <laughs> yeah, I learned quite a bit. Cool. Highly educational for me, and I hope uh, yeah, everyone listening got a lot out, out of this uh, discussion uh, here. So your book that got updated for iOS 12 Access for All, where can people find more information about that? So you can go to my website, which is iosaccessbook.com. The iOS 12 edition is out. The table of contents is on that website. So if you want to see how excruciatingly uh, detailed the book is, because it kind of is, uh, then you can view the contents there. The book is available from my site in an EPUB format, or you can go to the Apple Bookstore and buy it in the same format. It's the same book, basically. PDF version will be coming out soon, and I sell that book for uh, 25 bucks. I update it when the operating system calls for it and give free updates to customers who've bought the version for the current OS, and then uh, each year when the new OS uh, becomes available, I make a new one. Awesome. And then you do the excellent parallel podcast over at Relay.fm. What's yeah. the URL for that one? That's Relay.fm slash parallel. And the idea of the parallel is, I call it the, it used to be the parallel and now it's parallel. So that's why I say it that way accidentally sometimes. <laughs> uh, the yeah. idea of parallel is I want to talk about technology, but I want to talk about it with people from both the accessibility community and not. And so I bring a guest from the sort of mainstream tech community. A lot of times it's other podcasters. And then I bring somebody from the accessibility community and we talk about a topic for about an hour and sometimes it's uh, sort of newsy and topical and sometimes it's just something I've been thinking about and uh, before people hear this episode of your show Mm -hmm. there will be an episode about uh, living the iPad lifestyle living an iPad dominant lifestyle so uh, people would probably enjoy that that will be episode 12 of Parallel awesome yeah definitely have listened to that one it's a great show I've been listening as they've been coming out thank you and uh, thank you uh, for your time today Shell it's been great talking with you my pleasure I've enjoyed it Thanks for listening to this episode of iPad Pros. You can find the show notes over at iPadPros.net. You can send your feedback to me at iPadProsPodcast.gmail.com. If you email a voice memo, I'd be happy to include your audio on a future episode. I'm on Twitter at iPadProsPodcast. And as mentioned at the top of the show, if you haven't had a chance to review the show on Apple Podcasts, I highly encourage you to do so. Every review helps send signals to promote the podcast more in search and helps other people discover the show. Thank you for your time and attention today. Talk to everyone again real soon.